moving along uh, to the sessions. He's a writer, a journalist, a lecturer, broadcaster, and documentary maker, and has written four bestsellers. We cannot imagine to learn better about the influencer marketing economy from any other person. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome one of the Ireland's most influential Twitter users, economist David McWilliams, to make us understand how this economy really works. Thank you very much, uh, Idil. I hope I pronounced that properly. It's a total pleasure to be here this morning, a real treat to be here in Istanbul in such an extraordinary city, such an extraordinary city and an extraordinary country. Before I start, I would just like all of us, when you put these festivals together, these conferences, there's an enormous amount of work that goes on in the background. And Besta and her team have been phenomenal from start to finish. So could we all please give her and the team a huge round of applause. So they did a great job. A really good job. I'd also like to apologize in advance to the translators. You might not necessarily have ever heard a Dublin accent. So I'm going to try and speak like the Queen, okay? Just for you, okay? No, it's, uh, it's extraordinary to be here. And what I would like to look at is just very briefly, the first thing I want to talk about is structural change. The fact that the world is going through a massive, massive structural change. And the place to see this most conspicuously, in my opinion, is Ataturk Airport up the road. I was there the other day, and nothing so explains globalization as the faces of the people at airports, okay? If you go to an airport and you see people from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from far Asia, from deepest Africa, from America, what you know is that this is a country that is entirely plugged into the international world. So I decided, sorry Turkish Airlines, to rob your sky life magazine. Irish people kind of rob things, so you know, that's, that's our weakness. And I advise you all, when you're going home, I advise you all, go to page 192, because what it shows is the new economy of the world. It is Turkish Airlines connections, direct connections with the rest of the world, and it is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. So in my opinion, have a look at those maps See who's coming into Istanbul. See who's going out, because that is a great example of commerce. And the reason is very simple, is that the world's gravitational axis is shifting away from the Atlantic and Western Europe and the United States to this part of the world, starting in Shanghai, ending in Istanbul. It used to be called the Silk Road. Many, many hundreds of years ago, this was the center of the world. And in my opinion, it is going to go back to being the center of the world. And it won't take centuries or even decades. It will take years because of technology and the speed of change. So I think we're very, very lucky to be right here, right now, because we are at the beginning of something very special, not just for Turkey, but also for this whole stretch of the world's population, which goes from the Eastern Mediterranean all the way out to the Pacific in China, all the countries to the north, to the south. It's 60% of the world's population. And because America has dominated for so long, we feel that things that happen in Washington are kind of important, and they still are, bizarrely because it's quite a shock, isn't it, to see your man? I mean, if that's the best America can give us, I worry about the country. And I'm a big fan of the United States. But so just structurally, we are in this amazing moment of change. Now normally, economists will come up here with graphs and charts and mathematics, and they will give you definitive answers about everything. Because I'm an Irish economist, I'm not going to come with charts and graphs and maths. I'm going to come with poetry. 
I want to read you a little bit of poetry because what I want to tell you is this change you see in the world is not new. Sometimes because you have iPhones and Facebook and Instagram, you feel that this is a whole new world. It's not. In fact, what I want to do is I want to take you back to 1917, a hundred years ago this month. Sitting in Dublin, and interestingly, here in Turkey, a hundred years ago this month, this country was not yet born. The Ottoman Empire was falling apart. The Turkish army was fighting in Galicia on the Polish border against Russia. Turkey was fighting on all fronts. The First World War was at its height, and nobody really knew how it was going to pan out. And Ireland's national poet, a guy called W.B. Yeats, a fantastic poet, sat in Dublin, and he tried to figure out what is going on in this world. And he wrote a beautiful poem, a beautiful poem, okay? And I'm going to read a little bit of it, but I can actually remember it most from school. It's called The Second Coming. And it's about the poet sitting, trying to figure out what's going on all around him with wars and chaos. And you think technology is new. Imagine what it was like in 1917 when we had electricity for the first time, when we had cars for the first time, when we had radios for the first time. It obliterates the impact of the internet on people's day-to-day -day lives in terms of the change. So Yeats is sitting there and he writes, turning and turning in the gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed on the world, a blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the procession of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So here's the poet saying, things fall apart, the center doesn't hold, you get massive change, anarchy can be loose, and why is that? Because the best people in society lack all conviction, while the worst people in society are full of passionate intensity. Now I think a hundred years later, this is an incredibly apt description of our world, where the best people sometimes in society don't get involved, allowing the worst people in society full of passionate intensity to change the world in their image. So just keep that in the back of your mind. But the reason I want to talk about poetry is what really interests me is why did the poet, writing in 1917, why the poet, why did he see the world clearly? The poet, Yeats, was predicting when he said the center cannot hold the end of the Russian Empire the beginning of the Soviet Union, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the beginning of the new Turkish Republic, the end of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and the beginning of what we now know to be Central Europe, the end, interestingly, of the British Empire, with Ireland becoming independent, and the end of German domination under the Kaiser. Now, the question I have for you is why did the poet see all this, and the people who were paid to tell the future of the time, the journalists, the economists, the statisticians, the military people, the politicians, why did they not see this? Why did they predict that the world would broadly carry on as before, even after the wars? They didn't predict the chaos. Now, I believe it is because the poet, the artist, the musician, gives himself or herself the permission to think unconventionally. And once you give yourself the permission to think unconventionally, you can see things at a turning point. You can see the world changing. Why? Because you allow yourself to dream a little bit. You allow yourself to entertain different notions. Now, at tipping points, and we are at one now, at tipping points, you need unconventional thinkers. But we have a problem, and the problem is, do we reward unconventional thinking? We say we do. We always say, you know, we reward creativity, etc. But do we? So think about school. 
I know some of you aren't that long out of school. So go back to school, right? And think about school wherever you are, in whatever country, and think about the type of brain that was rewarded in your school. Was it a conventional brain or an unconventional brain? It was a conventional brain. What our schooling system does is it takes kids very, very early and rewards a certain type of intelligence. And that certain type of intelligence is the linear brain that can absorb information into its head, can put it there in a little compartment, and then when asked in an exam, can write it all down. But that's only one type of intelligence. And we all know as we get older that the world is full of different types of intelligence, full of different types of creativity, that every child has something going on in their brains, in their lives, in their personalities, which, if recognized, can be fantastic, but so often it's not recognized. Why? Because our education system does the following. It rewards conventional brains, and it actually punishes unconventional brains. Like, I have lots of friends of mine who say, you know, Jesus, I hate, well, sorry for taking the name of the Lord, but I mean, they say, I hated school. But it wasn't that they hated school. School hated them. School hated them. And what you notice as you get older as well is that because only a certain type of intelligence is rewarded in school, that lots and lots and lots of very, very clever people left school feeling very stupid. But the corollary is also the case. Lots and lots of actually quite stupid people leave school feeling very clever. And then what happens, what happens is, you know, their mothers tell them they're very clever, and in the Irish case, the priests tell them they're very clever. Like Irish mammies now are very weird. They're the sort of mothers that make Jewish mothers look unambitious. You know that type of mother, right? So, you know, if your mother's telling you from the start you're very clever, that's all fine. And then what happens, you, you do well in school, you do well in college, then you get a big job in one of the big institutions, in the professions, lawyers, accountants, management consultants, bankers, top civil servants. And then something very odd happens in life. We call it confirmation bias in economics. And it is that we end up liking people who think like us. And we end up employing people who think like us. And the result of this is that at the top of lots and lots of institutions in our world, what do we get? We get groupthink, that everybody thinks the same way. So when faced with a challenge, the logical answer is not the right answer because we always know, like in life you know that there's no single right answer. There are many, many right answers to every question. And we also know that when you're right, something odd is happening. You're not learning. You only learn when you're wrong. Because when you're wrong, you say, oh, okay, that's the way the world works. I'll change my thinking. So when you are right, and if you are always putting your status in being right all the time, you can't, you cannot say you're wrong because you have been schooled in being right all the time. So what you find at a tipping point when the world is changing and technology is changing and ethnicity is changing and nationalism is coming through and inequality is a massive issue, the response of governments tends to always be looking for the right answer and making big mistakes because we reward conventional thinkers from a very, very young age and we isolate the unconventional thinkers, the actual people we need in a crisis situation. And the interesting thing, Galbraith, John Kenneth Galbraith is a very famous Canadian economist. Uh, he's a Canadian. The Americans pretend he's American because he got a Nobel Prize. It's a bit that happens in Ireland, actually. When Irish writers win the Booker Prize, we're British. And when we're drunk on the tube in London, we're Irish. You know, it's a, it's a strange thing. We have to get over our, our weaknesses like that. But Galbraith said something about conventional people. He said that when faced with a choice between changing his mind and finding the proof not to do so, the conventional man always gets busy looking for the proof because they can't change their mind. So that is why we see so many massive mistakes being made by large organizations, by governments, by militaries, by strategic institutions. They don't see the crisis coming because they refuse to think like poets. 
and they're schooled to think like accountants, which is an awful thing for anyone, actually, young or old. So keep that in the back of your minds, and let's talk about economics, okay, and the world. The unfortunate thing about conventional thinking is my profession, the economist profession, is probably the biggest culprit, the least interesting, because they refuse to change their mind when the global economy is changing so quickly, and they wed themselves to old ideas. Like, I, I can see this in the kids I teach at Trinity, which is a university in Dublin, where I teach. I get the kids in fourth year. And by the time they're getting fourth year, they're already contaminated. So I have to tell them that the first three years, you forget about that stuff, and we'll start again. But I ask the kids, I say, OK, uh, what do you know about economics? And they say, oh, oh Jesus, Professor, uh, economics, uh, what's your first thing? They say, oh, God, man. Oh, yeah, economics says that man is rational. And I say, really? That's interesting. I say, how do you mean rational? They say, well, when, when people make economic choices, they are cold and scientific and calculating, and they are entirely informed by logic. I said, really, is that the way you think the world works? They say, well, that's what the book says. I said, really? I said, have you ever met a human being like that? I said, would you go for a drink with someone like that if you met them? No. Because economists say crazy things. Think about it. Like, they say things like, and you might have studied economics in college, taken a, a semester or two of it, right? They say things like, you know, when the demand, when the price of something goes up, the demand goes down. Well, those people say, well, that sounds right. But it's wrong. Think about Bitcoin. What happens when the price of Bitcoin goes up? Does the demand go up or down? It goes up. Because people panic and say, Jesus, if I don't buy now, it'll be $27 next week. So because of human psychology, you get economics that doesn't make any sense. And yet the world continues to absorb the messages of economics. Now, why does it not make sense? The reason is that we are unbelievably sociable creatures. Economics is only the study of human beings. All the little things that you do every day, the small, little decisions, the little investments, the little ideas, the, I'm going to buy that. When you aggregate all those up, that's the economy. That's it. So you don't understand economics unless you understand human nature. Unless you understand human nature. And what is it about humans that makes us different? What makes us different, and you guys should know this, is we are social creatures. We are hardwired to be social. What do you do in a society to really punish somebody? You put them into solitary confinement because that makes humans crazy because we need other humans. And the reason we need other, other humans is we love to talk. We love to talk. Why do you think, let's say if we go back to 100,000 years ago and we're all hanging out in Uganda or wherever, where the hell did we come from? Uganda or somewhere. Apparently, okay. We're all hanging out in Uganda, having a laugh, avoiding lions and tigers and fellas like that who do horrible things if they caught you. And if you were to have a bet on an animal in the savannah 100,000 years ago before we all went for a little walk, would you have bet on the human or the tiger? I'd have bet on the tiger. I'd, I'd, I'd take my chances with the tiger. Human, like funny little thing with a funny head, and can't really run or can't really climb, and just sits around chatting away to each other, right? You know, you would have thought, I'll go for the big cat who can jump around and eat things, right? But the difference between us and animals is we can talk. And once you can talk, you can form memories. And once you can form memories, you can form narratives and stories and ideas and identities, identities. So consequently, when we went for a walk, we went for a walk as a tribe, not as individuals. I mean, the amazing thing about Anatolia here is that this, the genetic footprint of people from Anatolia, is the most mixed in the world. Isn't that phenomenal? If you look at the genes of people from Anatolia, and you contrast them for people from Ireland, for example, like, we're pure, we got the ugly gene, by the way. You kind of got the good-looking gene. But we, we've dealt with that over the years. We can, we can deal with that, right? But we are not a mixed genetic bag. You are. Why? Because everybody came through here. Kept walking, chatting, 
and sleeping with each other and having a laugh and drinking a bit too much and then they say, oh, don't be doing that drinking, they get into trouble, blah, 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 right? Because we can talk, because we're social. Now think about how you impose that on the economy. Think about what actually happens in the economy. Everybody influences everybody else, which is why you're called influencers, okay? All of us are not rational, we're highly irrational, okay? Like, for example, at my stage in life, I have friends now on their second marriage, and I'm kind of saying, what bit of the first one didn't you get? <laughs> they go, oh, no, no, she loves me. I'm saying, no, no, as a rule, the 28-year-old girl doesn't love the 50-year-old guy. I, 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 don't, I don't think that really works that way, man. And I said, no, I swear to God, man, really, I swear to Jesus. Yeah, I said, okay, cool. I'll talk to you in a few years, right? Irrationality. That's what we are. That's how we are. So consequently, consequently, what we do is we're entirely suggestible. We're malleable. We don't know what we think. That's the beauty of humans. That's our survival instinct to be able to adjust. But that means in economics that what actually happens is... When there's a boom in something, like a housing boom, or a share price boom, or an internet boom, or a tech bubble, or a Bitcoin bubble, for example, we all get giddy together. Giddy, 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 giddy. We all say, oh my God, did you mind? He bought that for two pence and he sold it for 500 million. Jesus, I want some of that too. Giddy, 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 giddy. Oh shit. And then we're down, depressed, 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 depressed when the price goes down, right? And what makes the economy move is humans talking to each other. That's all it is. That's all it is. So it's an exercise in group psychology rather than in hard mathematics. And this is where you guys come in. This is where you guys come in because if you see, you know this thing the economists, you talk about the business cycle? The business cycle is nothing more than humans chatting all the time, getting enthusiastic as you go up, Enthusiastic, 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 and then somebody starts selling something and says, oh my God, here we go. And then, of course, the conversation goes from, do you remember he bought that house for two euros and it's now worth 200,000? Then the conversation is, you see your man, he bought his house for two million and now it's worth three pence and he's bust. And so we tend to move together. Now that's all it is. That's all it is. It's entirely driven by our suggestibility. Like I'll give you an example. For example, a friend of mine uh, bought one of those. You know, there's, well, a friend of mine, he's, you, know, he's, you know, there's two types of men in the world, I believe. There are car men and non car men, right? You know, those fellows who are into cars, who buy car magazines. You know, I find there's something kind of creepy about men who buy car magazines. You know, I do. I think you wouldn't know what else they're buying. There's something ugh, unclean about them, right? So, but a friend of mine is a car man, and he's all right. In fact, he's okay. But I remember one, uh, about three or four weeks ago, he came to me and he said, uh, he says, Macker, do you want to look at my car? Everyone, everyone calls each other by a nickname in Ireland. And I said, well, not really. I'm not that interested in your car, but why not? And he bought one of those, you know those huge 4x4s? Four you know the massive, big, black 4x4s? Four you know the ones you really need them in Dublin? You know? No, you do, because like, the Andean mudslides are shocking where we're from, right? And I looked at him and I said, uh, okay, I'll have a look at your car. So I went out and looked at this big car. And I said to him, I said, what's the story there, man? Why did you buy that yoke? Why did you buy that car? And he says, you know, it's very simple, Macker. He says, if I'm in a crash, the other lad's dead. <laughs> now, think of the logic behind that. The logic is all about second-guessing what somebody else does. That's what we're like. That's what humans are like, okay? When I was a kid, much younger, I used to work in a big bank in London. I, and, and I got a job in this big bank in London, and uh, I didn't realize, I don't know if you know what a Cockney, does anybody here know what a Cockney is? Cockneys are people from the east end of London. They're the real Londoners, and they are actually God's chosen race. They're fantastic, right? <laughs> they are fantastic, and they're like the Irish as well. They love Robin shit. They're great, okay? And so which makes them very good bankers at the end of the day. But I was having to... Uh, the job, the job of the economist in a big bank, I used to work in our central bank, which is that you just do mathematics and talk to yourself, right? But the job of an economist in a big bank is you have to get up like this and talk. And I'd never done that before. I was like, oh my God, I was nervous. The first day, you know, and you come in and I was in a suit that my mother bought me, right? And I looked like a fellow just made his communion in Ireland, okay? 
and I was sitting there, and I was really nervous. And you know when you notice your voice getting really high? Because you're so nervous. And you're like, oh, no, who's in here? Shit, it's me. Right? And, I was about, and I was trying to, of course, get the Cockneys on side. And uh, I started to speak to the Cockneys. And they looked at me, and I looked at them. And I was supposed to try and get them into my palm of my hand and make them feel that I was a credible economist for the bank. And I spoke, there was about 800 of them. Shock and sight. It's like, it's like watching West Ham, the whole thing, right? Okay? And I looked at them. I was trying to get on the side. And all I heard is, fucking hell, he's Irish. Because they don't expect Irish people in a suit in England, right? Because usually, we're usually building the roads and the factories and things like that. And they, Irish people usually have a nickname in England, which is either Paddy or Mick. Okay? You're either Paddy or you're Michael. Right? There's no David or Sean or John or... No, no, it's David. No, it doesn't matter. You're co Mick. All right, Mick. But they gave me a nickname in 1994, which was unpleasant because it stuck. They gave me the nickname of Semtex. Now, Semtex is, is an explosive that the IRA used to blow up banks in London. And this was the English be nice to me. This is a term of endearment. So I got really close to these cockers, but I just want to tell you about human nature, right? Their human nature. So every Christmas, we would get a bonus. And I would go off to Ireland and come back, and then the Cockneys would be all there after Christmas, right? I remember the very first Christmas, I, 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 all the Cockneys were around, me and, and the thing. And one of the Cockneys, a big fella, uh, and he started doing this, his very first day back, and he started doing this very weird, limp-wristed movement with his wrist, which was very kind of effeminate. And he wouldn't have been the sort of fella now who'd be at the front of the gay rights parades and all that sort of stuff, right? Be a different sort of lad altogether. But what he was trying to attract my attention to with his wrist was the watch that he'd bought with his bonus, right? And you know those watches that are so fancy, there's kind of six little watches in them. Like, you don't know if it's going to call in, I don't know, call in the, an airstrike or tell you the time or something. It's just weird, you know? And of course, he said to me, uh, I eventually said, I said, uh, all right. Actually, also, the problem with Cockneys is their parents are very unimaginative. They're all called Steve, right? So it's big Steve, little Steve, fat Steve, skinny Steve, you know, the whole thing. And uh, so I said to the, one of the Steves, he goes, Semtex, do you like my watch? I said, Jesus, yeah, the watch is lovely. Fantastic looking yoke. I said, and the question he wanted me to ask him was, how much did it cost? So I said, Jesus, how much did it cost? And he goes, well, it cost me 16,000 quid. I said, sweet lamb of Jesus, 16,000 quid. I said, what does an actual watch do for 16,000 quid? <laughs> and your man looks at me and he says, it tells the time at 800 feet below sea level. I'm thinking in my head, here was, this was a fat lad who'd never been out of the shallow end, right? Okay? So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what happened, that fool? You people got into his head. Influencers got into his bloody head, his stupid head, and told him he'd have better sex if he had the watch, or more girlfriends, or boyfriends, or better coke, and his dealer wouldn't rip him off, whatever his problem was, right? Because humans are suggestible. And the advertising industry drives the suggestibility, and it drives people to madness. And we have a fantastic battle between advertising and marketing and economics. That's what the business cycle is. You want to tell people what to do, and we eventually try to sort out the mess, right? When people go bust, okay? That's the, that's the thing. This is, this is the insights that we have. So then the reason is, the economy works like a group trip, okay? Okay? And everyone comes up together, and everyone's buzzing, and everyone comes down together. That's what happens. And marketing, and influencing, and advertising amplifies that trip, and then we get the great post-trip come down. That is how the economy works. So imagine, and the interesting thing is the individual who gets suckered in or gets influenced, has no idea that everybody else has been influenced at the same time too. So imagine the way the economy works is, imagine you're at a football match, right? Or a rugby match, or an American football, basketball, whatever your weakness is. We like rugby in Ireland because we're good at one thing for the first time in about 100 years. Our rugby team is actually quite okay. But it's only okay because we only play seven under other countries in the world that play it. So it's like our World Cup is like us and the Australians and the New Zealanders, and that's it, okay? But think, think you're at a, at, a, at a Galatasaray game or a Fenerbahce game, okay? And you're sitting down in the stadium, and you bought good tickets, and you're sitting down in the stadium, right? 
and everything is hunky-dory, and then your team get the ball, right? And they go up towards the goal of the opposition team. Now, what happens? You had a very good view, and then what happens is the guy in front of you stands up because he gets excited, and he wants to get a better view. And then you have to stand up. Then the guy behind you to stand up, and the girl behind you, and the girl behind you. And then suddenly, the entire football stadium is standing when we had paid to sit. That is exactly what happens in the economy. So, for example, when you buy your Bitcoin, right? You think, oh, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm a genius, right? But you're only a genius if nobody else buys the shit, okay? If everybody else buys it, then you're all poorer and riskier together. So if you buy the swanky watch, like my friend, okay, the one with the six little watches in it, and you think you're going to be the big guy, you're only the big guy as long as nobody else buys it, right? And if you buy a funny big swanky house with a kitchen, with an island in it, okay, and those massive big fridges that we now have, which are absolutely necessary. I don't know, have you noticed it's the same in Turkey? The fridges have got bigger. Can somebody tell me what happens in a walk-in fridge? Like, who lives in there? Like, why do we do it? It's like, Jesus, what's got that, that big, huge thing, right? Why? But again, it only gives you utility or satisfaction if nobody else does it. But the banking system ensures that everybody else does it. Because the banks lend into this ridiculous aspirations that drives us all. And I'm the same as everybody else. I'm the same as everybody else, you know? My daughter is here, okay? She came with me to see, to look at the world. And it's really pathetic. We had a father and daughter fashion show this morning in the, hotel, in the room. I was like, should I do, wear this or should I not? She's like, dad, just go out there. So we're all in nervous and we're all insecure. And all of us have this madness, right? But think about now the way in which the world is turning. Think about these big tipping points. Think about globalization. Think about, let's, let's think about Bitcoin, right? So the one question I've been asked here all the time is, what do I think of Bitcoin? And it's really interesting. So the influencers and the marketers have one view. The economists say, this is a bubble. It will all burst and you'll be bankrupt, okay? And it might go to 17,000 or yada, 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 but it's about... And the marketers believe that this is a brave new world, that technology is going to destroy money and for some reason, this is going to be a good thing. So what you have is these two countervailing attitudes all the time. The whole world, our capitalist world, is a big fight between economics and marketing. Okay? And the interesting thing is that the stakes are very high. Because the stakes are not just low. A couple of years ago, you could say, well, you know, it's only about individual. Now we have nationalism, ethnic violence, we have inequality, people getting left behind without a stake. And when you have inequality, people vote for the guy who says, I'll fix it. You know the guy with the, with the orange hair in America, that fella? Okay, they vote for that guy, right? Rational people vote for a lunatic. It's like what happened in Britain. There used to be a normal country. We used to really get pissed off in Ireland because the Brits always did the right thing eventually. And then they just got a rush of blood to the head and said, okay, we're leaving Europe. Crazy stuff because of inequality because the system is not delivering. And as a consequence of that, the system is fragile and unstable. And then finally, this brings me to your role. Because imagine the power that you have in a system that is fragile. Imagine the power that you have when millions of people are looking at Instagram. I need to get a facelift before I do Instagram, frankly. I'll stick to Twitter, nobody can see me, right? Okay, if you see me on Instagram, you'll know I've had an appointment with a surgeon, right? Okay, I'll look like that, okay? Okay, but think about your power as influencers in the global economy. It is enormous, it is real, and it is getting bigger. Because old media, where I still work, is being outflanked by you guys, and you have a direct communication. So therefore, you also have in this crazy, fragile world, we were down with those refugees the other day, okay? Those refugee kids deserve as big a chance as my kids. 
They deserve, they've got as much potential as Irish kids. They've got the same dreams. Those kids have the same dreams as I had when I was a young fella, okay? And they will get their piece of the cake. They will get it some way on the move as refugees, as immigrants. This is what's happening. And therefore, you have enormous, enormous power. And consequently, I just want to go back to the poet. What did the poet say? He said that sometimes the center doesn't hold. Sometimes things fall apart. In 1917, the world as we knew it broke down, particularly for Turkey particularly for Turkey. Turkey went through a massive revolutionary change between 1917 and 1922 like you could never have predicted, ever, ever. The whole world thought you were going to become a British colony, by the way. I'll tell you about that later, okay? We went through it, okay? Not a good idea, okay? But it's up to you, therefore, as the next generation. And what Yeats said is that when things are fragile, Political and economic outcomes are bad only when the best people in society lack all conviction, lack all morals, lack all attitudes. And the worst people in society are allowed to be full of passionate intensity and dominate the news flow and the political agenda and the economic agenda and the social agenda. So I believe that you guys in the room are the best in society. And therefore, you have a huge responsibility, a huge responsibility for your generation and for my generation, but for your generation in particular, to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to move political and economic and social opinion in the right way. So read a bit of Yeats. Poetry is always good. Realize that the world hasn't changed dramatically in the last 100 years, that technology always changes people's perceptions, but also that you are the best you have the responsibility, and go out and do it. So thank you very much. Thank you.